Well, good morning and Happy New Year to all of you. I hope that this year has started out well for each one of you. And I want to say a personal word of thanks to each of you for the prayers and outreach that you have made uh, towards me and my family. My mother was released from the hospital this week, and so now we are trying to figure out the new normal um, with her health care conditions as she lives with us. Uh, my sister Debbie is still in the hospital, um, and uh, my husband is recovering well from COVID, but that's why I had the mask on as I came in here today, and I'll put it on as I exit today as well. Um, praise God, though. I continue to be um, totally free of all of the viruses and flus that are around as I navigate between all of these family members. So I hope and pray that each one of you stays well as we enter this new year together. There are many exciting things that are happening in the life of our congregation, and I hope that you will pick up a copy of The Connection out in the hallway or that you received one through email. If you're watching online, I welcome you, and I hope that you will see the connection that you will be able to make through our website to get a copy of our newsletter and see all the wonderful things that are taking place in the life of our church. As we begin our time of worship with one another today, I invite you to please stand as you are able to join with me in our call to worship. Lord, this new year we will follow the star of Bethlehem. Too long we've gone the wrong way, followed the wrong stars. We went south following movie stars, greed and lust, star of wonder. We went east following stars of militarism, nationalism, and war, star of light. We even went north following our own visions, our own intuition, and our own way. Star with royal beauty bright, this year we will follow the star of Bethlehem, the star of hope, the star of peace, the star of joy, the star of love, the star that is you. Amen.
seated. And let us pray. Loving God, you know us intimately, all our thoughts, fears, and failures, yet you love us no matter what. Help us live like we are your beloved children. Comforting God, you promise that you will be with us at all times. Please help us see and feel your presence and receive the peace you offer us. Lord, we lift up all those who are having a tough time, whether it's due to sickness or financial or relational problems. Lord, to all these, give strength and comfort those who mourn. Let them know that you walk with them and will never leave them. Enfold them in your love and care. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us join our voices. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now I would like to invite all the children to come down for children's moments with Miss Beth. Well, many of you know that I started out my ministry at Trenum Road United Methodist Church, and I am pleased to see Joel Jones here with us today, one of the former ministers at Trenum Road Methodist Church, and of course, Don Britt, who was my mentor for so many years. I recall Don telling one of his favorite stories. One of his favorite stories, he said, was told by the late Lance Webb, who was elected bishop in the United Methodist Church back in 1964 and served in the Illinois Conference. Do you remember this story, Don? No. <laughs> <laughs> he said he's too old to remember. Well, I'll remind you. He said that Lance Webb told a story about some new Marine recruits at Paris Island near Beaufort, South Carolina. And as part of their basic training, we know their heads were shaved. They were stripped of their clothes and they were told to sit on the floor in a small room. Don's smiling now, he's remembering the story, right? They were told to sit in that room until they were called for. Well, the weather turned rather cold and there they sat their bodies shivering in the cold, their lips turning blue, their, their teeth chattering as they sat there without their warm clothes on their body and with their heads shaved bald. And one of the young recruits leaned over to one of the other recruits and whispered, who did you used to be? Well, Don told that story, and I retell it to you now, because baptism reminds us of who we are, who we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to do with our lives. Two of the fundamental questions that all of us have in life are who am I and what am I supposed to do with my life? Many years ago, I read a book entitled The Path, and in that book, I remember reading that all of us are searching for that path, that path that we are called to walk in life. Some of us feel like we are searching for that for ages and ages and ages, trying to figure out what did God want me to do with my life? What is my purpose? In the book, Repacking Your Bags, the writers state that their research shows that the number one deadly fear of people is having lived a meaningless life. Psychologists tell us that we cannot find meaning in our lives, find contentment in any of our relationships, find happiness in any job, or fulfill any of our dreams until we are clear about who we are. Because what we believe and think about ourselves is clearly and unequivocally reflected in everything we say and do, in the work that we choose to do in our life, in the places we choose to live, in the family that we surround ourselves with, and in the service to others that we volunteer to do, and in our spiritual lives. In order to make the most of our lives, we need to be clear about who we are, for that sets the direction for where we will go in life. So I'm starting a sermon series today entitled Reset, looking at resetting our lives on that path that God has called us to be on. And maybe you feel like you are on that path, and so hopefully this sermon series will give you encouragement to stay on that path. But maybe you're like me. You're in a season of life where life around you seems unsettled, and you're trying to figure out, now where am I supposed to go now? What is my direction in life at this point? Well, part of what I've been doing as we moved my mother into our house, mom is now 92 years old, and I have been going through boxes and boxes of stuff that I left in her house when I moved out after college. And 
why my husband calls me a hoarder because I kept all of these things at mom's house. Here is a paper I wrote for English 101 in college. <laughs> but what you might find interesting is the title of it is A Female Pastor, To Be or Not To Be. <laughs> now, I wrote this paper when I was attending a very fundamentalist, conservative college. At the time, I didn't realize that a Christian wasn't a Christian wasn't a Christian. I didn't realize there were different flavors and different directions. I just wanted to follow where I felt like God was leading me. So I went to my senior pastor at the time, the Reverend Frank Griffith at Virginia Wingard Methodist Church here in Columbia. And I said, Frank, I, I feel like God's calling me to be a pastor. Can you give me some books? Now, you have to understand, this was in the 1980s. And women were first ordained in the Methodist Church in 1956. South Carolina, as you know, tends to be a little bit behind the rest of the nation in this progressive movement. So I didn't know any female pastors. But it didn't matter. I really felt like God was calling me to be a pastor. And Frank said, sure, and he gave me books to read, and I wrote my paper. And part of what I wrote, I want to read to you. I wrote, some Roman Catholics and other Orthodox groups are still opposed to the idea of ordaining women into the ministry. Reasons given for their adverse attitude include various social problems that women ministers may encounter. For instance, the danger of women being out alone at night, the emotional strain of the ministry, and possible childbearing complications are among their major concerns in this area. My professor wrote in the sidelines, not about my English, but the point is, he said, those are true concerns. You should be worried about those. <laughs> so I continued on and quoted Dr. Harkness and said that women in police, detective, and social workforce face the dangers of night work more frequently than female pastors do. Yet no one is stopping women from entering those fields. In regard to the emotional strain, Dr. Harkness writes, most women who desire to enter ministry are sturdy enough to endure the strains. And then I went on to address um, the possibilities of complications during a woman's childbearing years. And I said, again, this problem is not unique to ministry, but this does not dismiss it from consideration. Young married women in the ministry do have the option of taking a leave of absence for the sake of bearing children, and once the child is old enough to be away from the mother, she may return to the ministry. And my professor wrote, Incredible! Is that biblical? <laughs> At the very end of my paper, the professor wrote, are you a Methodist? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I really felt like God was calling me to be a pastor. And my pastor, Frank Griffith, didn't seem to have a problem with it. But here I was in a Bible college and being told, you need to rethink this. I talked with a professor afterwards, and he said, I don't doubt that God's calling you to something, but God's probably calling you to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> it is hard for us to know who we are and for us to know what we are to do with our lives when there are so many other voices around trying to tell us who we are and what we are called to do with our lives. Sadly, because of those comments, 
I stepped away and reevaluated my life and wondered, is God really calling me to be a pastor? And I pursued other avenues of vocation in my life, trying to figure out who I was and had I misunderstood what God was calling me to do. My friends, we find our true identity in our baptism. Our baptism is where we hear those same words that Jesus heard, the words that we are beloved and we are called by God. But I want you to notice something, if you didn't notice it in the reading of the text today from Luke's Gospel. You see, all of the Gospels tell us about Jesus' baptism, but Luke includes a detail that the others do not. Luke said that others were being baptized, and so was Jesus. And while he was praying is when he heard God's voice tell him that he was beloved. While he was praying. And you see, that's really how I came back around to being ordained in the Methodist Church is I had to remember my baptism, that God had named me and claimed me and given me gifts and called me to do something in ministry. And I had to do that in prayer to listen to where God was calling me to do. You see, God consistently reveals God's self to us in times of quiet prayer and meditation, when we are silent and still long enough to hear God's voice. I heard a story one time about a young man who'd lost his job, and he didn't know what to do. He didn't know where God was calling him to do with his life, what direction he needed to take. And so he went to an old preacher and he was pacing back and forth in that preacher's office, just ranting and raving about how he did not know what to do with his life. The man ranted on and on about his problem, and finally he clenched his fist so tight, and he shouted, I have begged and begged and begged God to tell me what to do and what direction to go in, and why doesn't God answer me? And the old preacher who sat across the room behind his desk, spoke something very quietly, something in a hushed and indistinguishable tone. The young man stepped across the room closer to the pastor's desk, and he said, what did you say? And the pastor again repeated what he had said, but he did so in that very soft voice, soft as a whisper. And the young man moved closer and leaned across the pastor's desk and said, I couldn't hear you. Can you say it again? His head was almost touching the forehead of the pastor at that point. And the pastor whispered to him, he said, God sometimes whispers so that we will move closer to God. Wow. In kneeling, in prayer, and being quiet, in drawing closer to God in order to hear God's voice, God will speak to us a word of direction, a word of direction of where we need to go. And perhaps that's the reason why nothing draws the attention of the human spirit like a whisper. When someone whispers, our eyes are fixed on them. We draw closer so that we can distinguish exactly what it is that they are saying. God whispering means we need to stop our ranting and our complaining and just be still to hear that still, small voice of God speaking to us, calling us and telling us the direction we need to go. I am here today because I took that time, finally, 
to be still long enough to hear God's whisper amidst all the clamor and the noise in the community around me. My friends, don't let others define who you are. Don't let others tell you what you need to do with your life. The God who created you has a purpose for your life and a calling and has gifted you with gifts to use in this kingdom. Because notice what Jesus did right after his baptism. Jesus began his ministry. Baptism is an anointing to each one of us to go out and to do the work that we are called to do. In the United Methodist Church, when we go through the ritual of baptism, we ask particular questions. We ask people if they renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness in this world. And we ask them if they will be faithful to this community of faith that is open to people of all nations, ages, and races. We ask if they will profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and seek to live after Christ's example of life. And we do that because knowing who we are, we will know what we are called to do. We are to do those works that Jesus did to renounce those spiritual forces of evil and w wickedness in whatever forms they present themselves. And we are to open up the arms of Christ to this community so that all may know that they are God's beloved. As we begin this new year, I am reminded of something that I learned in my first appointment as a senior pastor. I was appointed to two small churches in Edgefield County, and the biggest thing that would happen on the weekends were the football games. So I attended more football games when I was in Edgefield than I had ever attended in my life. And I learned some things about football. One of the things I learned is that the least important thing about a game is the score at halftime. Things can change dramatically in the second half of the game, can't they? And the same is true about our lives. No matter what you feel like has happened to you in your past, today can be a day of new beginnings. For our God is a God who promises new beginnings to each and every one of us. If we reset our souls in a way that we are committed to a life of prayer, listening for God's direction in our life, God's grace will move us forward into that future that God has called us into. There is an old, old story that reminds me of this. Some of you know it well. It's entitled, The Touch of the Master's Hand. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it's scarcely worth his while to waste much time on an old violin, but he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folks?' he cried. "'Who'll start the bidding for me? "'A dollar, a dollar, who'll make it two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, "'going for three, but no.' From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars? Who'll make it two? Two thousand and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We do not quite understand what changed its worth, the man replied. The touch of the master's hand. And many a man with a life out of tune and battered and torn with sin is auctioned and cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, going twice. He's going and almost gone. 
but the master comes and the foolish crowd never quite understands the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. My dear friends, our master is our savior, our creator, our redeemer and our sustainer. May you feel God's touch in your life. May you listen for God's voice as we enter this new year together. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.